So I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Patterson for his paper, which I found both uh, provo thought-provoking and interesting, speaking poetically of the poetic nature of speech. At one level, my response could be a very brief yes and amen, since there was nothing in the paper that I particularly disagreed with, and much with which I profoundly agreed. However, even if nine minutes of silence in a day full of words may be both welcome and perhaps even useful, I thought I'd better say something more. Um, so this is a, a, a response, what came to me as I was reading Professor Patterson's paper. And two things kept coming to mind, concerning, concerned with what we might call poiesis. The first is to do with the relationship between poetic or poetic language and prophecy. And the second is linked to ideas first expressed by Marshall McLuhan over half a century ago, but which seem to me to be still relevant today. One of the synonyms in English for poet or writer is a wordsmith, which I discovered is a relatively recent coinage, analogous to, for example, blacksmith, someone who crafts something in and out of language. Poetic language, then, is the making of attached meaning out of what we have. The attempt to give sense to and speak the world as we experience it, and to take us beyond the obvious to see new connections and possibilities. These are tasks proper at one level to every human being, but particularly to the poet, the philosopher, and the theologian. If our language is to say anything, it must be iconic, recognizing and even embracing its limits at the same time as it can only express itself within these limits. This is the antinomic encounter of the cataphatic and apophatic, where what can be heard and said comes up against what is beyond our hearing and beyond our saying. And yet, even this demands to be heard and said. And this creative and impossible but necessary task of poetic language is also prophetic. It's presumably not by accident that so often in the Old Testament prophets we read phrases like this, uh, which I take from the, the second verse of the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. The word of speech must be heard in order to be repeated, as Professor Patterson's lecture made so clear. And that word is a word of challenge, the challenge to change, to accept consolation, to acknowledge wrongdoing, to see new possibilities in the world. Wrestling with language changes us, and those who wrestle with language, the poets, demand, demand of us that, and however they express it, we heed the word of the Lord and respond to it. This brings me to my second point. Marshall McLuhan famously defined media as the extension of the human, which is why he could helpfully see many different phenomena as media. So, for example, he considered media not only such things as print media or electronic media or so-called today social media, but essentially all tools, for example, even money. And they extend us because they transform our way of interacting with the world and thus change the way in which we perceive and operate within the world to give a, a very simple example. If you have something like a stone to dig with, it takes you less time than with your fingers. And that time that you have left over enables you to think of the next step to take. This can seem at times like a picture of humanity as always seeking ways to avoid work, which may be explained by the fact that McLuhan taught university students. But the underlying idea is still important. The presence of media extends us, changes our participation in the world, 
and thus fundamentally changes our world. But the question that arises about, is about the destination of that extension or change. Where are we being taken? And is it somewhere we really want to go? We can develop better medicines, but also better, that is, more murderous weapons. And these themselves are media that extend us, so that we can bring more healing or more death. McLuhan was hugely aware of these challenges. And one of the problems that we face with much modern technology is that we move from the old ethical maxim that ought implies can to a new one where can implies ought. The fact that we can send anonymous, abusive messages to anyone with whom we disagree means that we ought to. The medium extends but in a way that is not necessarily creative. Of course, as Professor Patterson rightly pointed out, the story is more complex, and sometimes the chance to speak out and be heard needs to be taken. So perhaps in the end, as for example in the book of Jeremiah, we come down to the debate between true false and true prophets. Not all sounds, not all speech is prophetic. I don't want to offend any pirates, but uh, parrots can mimic sounds and we can listen to those sounds and be impressed. But parrots are not, I regret to say, prophets, at least not for human beings. One of the fundamental insights of early communication theory was to do with the nature of noise, the interference in the signal between sender and receiver. The question then becomes one of finding ways to filter out that noise. How can the true prophet be heard? How do we find time to listen to what has been said, to engage with, what, with that which truly extends us towards the transcendent, rather than drags us down to the lowest common denominator? Uh, Donald Trump, one might say. Fortunately... I avoided mentioning his... <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Fortunately, I do not have time to try to respond to those questions here. And responses, of course, are not simple. But one thing at least can be said. Well, in the original paper, Professor Patterson ended with a comment on the task of philosophy. And I'd like to end with a comment on the task of theology. As theologians, we are called also to be poets. Allowing the logos to transform us into poets of the word, makers within language of prophetic speech that announces God to the world in a way that extends what it is to be human to include the transcendent. Thank you. <laughs>